super, super excited to welcome you this evening to Decarcerating Care, Laying the Foundations for Liberated Practice. Uh, we're just going to wait a minute or two for people to join us, but while we are waiting, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know uh, where you're calling in from, why you're excited about this event, and we'll get started in just a minute. We have a couple of opening slides, so I think I'm going to dive in so we can get to the panel. Um, just for a quick introduction, my name is Jessie Roth. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the Institute for the Development of Human Arts, and I'm going to give just a really brief visual description of myself. I am a white woman with dark brown hair. Uh, I have bangs. My hair is in a bun on top of my head. I'm wearing headphones and I have a gray shirt and there is a photograph on a white wall behind me. Um, so once again, welcome to Decarcerating Care, uh, part three of Ida's discussion series. Super glad you're all joining us this evening. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the Institute um, and then we're going to get into our panel discussion. So Ida is a community of current and prior mental health service users and survivors psychiatrists, psychologists, and other clinicians, activists, and artists who have all come together with the goal of transforming mental health care. And what we do at IDA is we are advancing critical, effective, and scalable alternative approaches to mental health through collaborative education and community development. Um, and a big part of how we do that is panel discussions like this. Um, what makes us unique at IDA is integrating experiential and academic knowledge with the goal of challenging the idea that those who work in the field as quote unquote professionals are the experts. And really what we're trying to do with conversations like this is shift power dynamics in this mental health system that we find tends to privilege professional experience at the expense of other perspectives. Uh, we have a couple of community agreements this evening which um, guide our dialogue with, within the panel but also within the chat. So we bring shared expertise and wisdom, acknowledging everyone has their own expertise to lend to the conversation. We can all gain from and respect each other's various expertise. Collective liberation. Overcoming oppression aids everyone's liberation. It is our responsibility to challenge various forms of prejudice. We educate in the spirit of solidarity and hold each other accountable without criticizing who we are as people. And listen like allies. We respect a wide diversity of choices and perspectives, even when we disagree, and we do not judge or invalidate other people's experiences. So some quick notes on accessibility. We have live closed captioning available for the event. Um, you can click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen to turn this feature on. You can also hide subtitles if you don't want to see those. Um, we also have two ASL interpreters joining us today who will be swapping out um, throughout the event. Super glad to have our access team here. And finally, we aim to use visual descriptions whenever possible. So this means um, a description like the one I gave at the beginning um, of kind of the person speaking. Also on tech, uh, you can reach out to Liza Tech in the chat if you're having uh, challenges. We are, as you can see, recording the event, which we will share with everybody who registered later. And we finally really invite you to join the conversation in the chat. Feel free to use that space to share your thoughts, your reactions, and also your questions. Um, we might not be able to answer all questions today, but we always save the chat. We look forward to engaging with that dialogue as we move forward beyond this evening. So just a quick lay of the land of where we're headed from here. Um, I'm going to pass the mic shortly to our moderator for the evening, Jackie Johnson. Um, our panelists will do introductions and then we will dive into a Q&A. So um, just to introduce Jackie Johnson, Jackie is a social justice art therapist and founder of Sankofa Healing Studio, a nonprofit holistic mental health and wellness space in Philadelphia that specializes in supporting the Black community as it relates to the intersectionality of adverse childhood experiences, racism, and the carceral system. She is also an adjunct professor in the Community Trauma Counseling Program at Jefferson University, elected steering committee member of the Philadelphia Reentry Coalition, board member of the Dignity Act Now Collective, 
And last but not least, uh, Jackie is a board member with the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. So um, again, thank you all for being here. I'm really looking forward to seeing your dialogue in the chat. And with that, I will pass it to Jackie. Hello, greetings all. Um, so my name is Jackie. I am a black woman who has a gray sweater on. Um, my hair is pulled back and I have dangly round earrings uh, with the Sankofa symbol. So again, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this third installment of a decarcerating care discussion series. Our previous two panels provided powerful dialogues about alternatives to policing that truly center the voices of those with lived experiences, voices that provide information on how we can respond to a mental health crisis without the use of social control. Our panelists this evening include activists and practitioners from varied backgrounds. They will share with us ways that they have been able to provide support or encourage client-centered care while also navigating multiple systems that perpetuate harm. And that's inclusive of the mental health system, the legal system, the education system, and all the other systems that are also intricately linked together. This discussion will provide concrete tools of how all of us can challenge the status quo, whether we are professional providers, caregivers, activists, or advocates. Our guests will share their approaches to creating a liberated practice. Now, in order to lay the foundations of liberated practice, we need to explore the existing layers of bureaucracy where barriers exist. Keep in mind, when there are challenges to the status quo, we expect pushback to follow, and it has. We'll talk about liberated practice. What does that even mean? And should there be a place for activism within the mental health field? Does a mental health professional have a responsibility to challenge the systems that they work within? What about the code of ethics? Should we consider that these guidelines and rules can actually perpetuate cycles of oppression? And what if they do? How do mental health workers push back against systems that center compliance over an individual's right to autonomy? These are examples of when ethical codes don't actually feel that ethical. Now, as a community, we are obligated to de deconstruct systems that are rooted in oppression. In order to understand the how, we must first understand the who and the why. The truth is many mental health spaces aren't culturally aligned with the communities that they serve, nor do they have diverse representation at the decision tables. This generalized practice is not trauma informed, nor is it trauma responsive. So why is it a prevailing dynamic? Trauma has become a buzzword, yet the systems in place often re-traumatize individuals because they fail to center humanity over antiquated evidence-based models that actually balk at the notion that mental health care could be and should be holistic and a collaborative process free from mandates. Here's the thing, we cannot mandate healing. Our current system's attempt to provide support has actually become a form of control. We must be intentional to not replace one oppressive system with another. Now, I'd like to share a quote with you. This is attributed to St. Bernard Clairvaux somewhere around the 10th century. He said, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Now understand, it's important that we understand that these intentions and impacts are not always in alignment. We must listen to individuals with li lived experience when they share what the impact has actually been on them and their families. What we have the power to do is shift the ways in which we engage people who are experiencing mental health challenges and or crisis. We as a collective have the power to hold space, not sessions, to center communal care over carceral harm. That being said, I'd like for us to get started with you meeting our panelists. After those introductions, I will begin to ask each panelist questions about their work and the many tools that they can share. I invite the listening audience to be part of this conversation. 
Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section as we dialogue. We truly wanna hear from you. And with that, I'd like to start with our first panelist to introduce themselves. Uh, so if I can be joined by Vivian. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for that wonderful grounding. I don't know. I'm going to have a trouble adding to it, um, but I'll do my best. My name is Vivian Guevara. I am a uh, less richly pigmented indigenous Mexican woman, and I'm sitting on a lime green sofa with pillows in shades of green and a white wall behind me. My hair is pulled back in a tight bun with a side part, and I'm wearing gold toned Fulani earrings and a dark gray denim shirt. And I am here representing NAASW, which is the Network to Advance Abolitionist Social Work. We're a group of social workers who came together in the past year to discuss and figure out how to bring um, decolonization to social work and our students in our classes um, and in our field. Um, I, by day, I'm a social worker. At, I'm a public defender social worker for the Federal Public Defender in Brooklyn. Um, and I also uh, am a restorative justice and transformative justice practitioner outside of my job. So with those two things, I'm trying to balance um, what I see as freedom in my restorative justice and transformative justice work and what I see as working within a very punitive car carceral system, obviously as a public defender. And as a public defender, um, I'm often very conflicted about what I'm doing as part of the system about uh, what I'm asked to do, and also what I'm pushing myself to fight against as a public defender within the work that I do within my office, when I'm working with clients who are incarcerated, um, when I'm working with people who are no longer incarcerated, but have a huge say in, or who I think should have a huge say in what happens uh, when people are arrested, what happens when people are imprisoned, um, and whether or not those prisons should exist, which as a part of NAASW, we are all abolitionists. Um, so I'm here to share with you and learn from you and learn with you about how to bring abolition um, into care work, into caring fields. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And now if, uh, Jess, if you could come and introduce yourself. Oh yeah, I'm Jess Stillman Rainey. I use she and her pronouns. Uh, I am a white settler and I live in so-called Denver, Colorado, which is land stolen from the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, and Sioux people. Um, I am a fat white femme with short, like orange creamsicle colored hair. I have a septum ring and like rainbow glasses on. Um, I have big plastic earrings on that are shaped like psychiatric medications. I thought they were funny for this topic um, a little bit, um, maybe some dark humor there. And um, I tend to talk with my hands a lot and I wear a lot of rings. Um, so sometimes there's like uh, that going on on the screen as well. Um, and I have a, a lot of tattoos. Um, I'm at a desk right now with a dining table and bookshelf behind me. Um, I identify as a mad person, uh, specifically a voice hearer and a suicidal person because of my experiences with the things that get called psychosis and suicide, I've experienced psychiatric incarceration and abuse firsthand um, and have um, experienced things like seclusion, restraint, um, sexual and physical violence in, in uh, treatment settings. Um, as a white person, I think my experiences primarily took place um, within the within mental health facilities as opposed to um, other parts of the carceral system. Uh, but I have a little bit of a record from that anyway. And um, I am a suicidologist professionally. So I'm interested in work at the intersections of lived experience, liberation, and mental health. Um, I feel pretty strongly that we shouldn't be thinking about this work unless we're doing it. Um, so I also teach at the University of Denver Graduate School of Professional Psychology and I'm the director of programs for our statewide uh, crisis and peer support lines here. Um, and my beliefs around sort of abolition don't always line up with um, the systems that exist. And so I'm sort of constantly in tension trying to balance those things um, and do world building things like within systems that exist to create something a little bit better than what we currently have. Thank you so much, Jess. 
And now if Erica, if you could introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Erica Woodland. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm currently based in Baltimore, also known as the land of the Piscataway, the Nanticoke, and the Susquehannock. Um, I am a Black transmasculine person. I'm wearing glasses. I have long locks. Um, I'm also wearing a Black button-up, and I'm sitting in a big room with a wooden screen behind me. I really appreciate this conversation and this series because I think the more of us that that can engage in conversation around the actual strategies and practice connected to abolition, I think we're gonna see large scale transformation in care work and specifically in social work. So I come to this work by way of harm reduction um, and doing organizing and care work around HIV AIDS. Um, and I also come to this work by way of organizing for prison abolition and the freedom of all political prisoners. And so my journey into social work was to um, not become a part of the profession per se, but to get a set of skills so that I felt equipped to respond to and support folks who were navigating um, all kinds of survivorship and specifically looking at um, recovery and healing from state violence and intergenerational trauma. So I, get, I have a lot of gratitude for my community, my mentors, my teachers, my ancestors and all the folks who poured into me to give me training in so many different contexts. And the work that I do now is really rooted in healing justice. And I like to think about what healing justice work looks like on the micro, meso and macro levels. So I integrate that work into my clinical practice as a psychotherapist and clinical supervisor. Um, I do work with movement organizations as a consultant and facilitator to really think about um, how do we center healing justice in our strategy for organizing and liberation? I'm also the founding director of the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network. And our not so secret agenda is we're trying to politicize and organize mental health practitioners. Um, our work focuses on psychotherapists, but what we know is that most of our communities care um, is accessed outside the system. And so we actually um, consider folks a part of our network and fam family who are providing emotional and spiritual care, no matter where that comes from. So one of the things I think is really important about this conversation tonight and, and kind of my stake in this conversation is that I see my work as part of a long legacy of abolition, going back to the abolition of slavery. And being someone who's from the state of Maryland and who um, is continuing to work um, through the guidance of Harriet Tubman, it feels really important to honor her legacy by not allowing systems of control, domination, and surveillance get intertwined with our care, right? She did not sacrifice all that she did for the freedom, specifically of enslaved Africans, for us to then recreate systems that are rooted in exploitation and violence and, mirror, and married with care. And so I feel really grateful to be a part of this panel tonight, and I'm also excited to learn from everyone who else is going to be speaking. Thank you so much for that, Erica. If now, um, Irisha, if you can introduce yourself. Yes. Thank you, Jackie. Hello, everyone. My name is Irisha Pika, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm a dark-skinned Black woman with short natural hair and big hoop earrings. Um, I have on a gray t-shirt that says read. I'm sitting in my living room in West Philadelphia, and behind me is a picture of the freedom fighter, Asada Shakur. Um, I'm a mental health professional. I've been working in mental and behavioral health for a little over 12 years now in various capacities. And I'm currently a clinical supervisor at a mental health institution here in Philadelphia. Um, I've written a lot on mental health, um, especially around like self-care in various journals and newspapers. And in 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2015, I co-edited a book on black and brown mental health and narratives called The Color of Hope, People of Color Mental Health Narratives. Um, I recently hosted a digital show around wellness check-ins for Black women called Sis, Are You Good? Um, for the Girl Trek um, Incorporation. Um, and I've also spent quite a number of years, probably over a decade, doing prison abolitionist 
anti-police brutality, uh, reproductive justice, and birth work. Um, my stake in this, as a mental health advocate and abolitionist, I want mental health care to be accessible to anyone who wants it and need it, especially the people who are impacted by it um, most harshly from the system, like people like me who are Black, who are women, who are queer, um, as someone who grew up poor and without having the resources or the awareness to access mental health services. So I'm here to share and I'm also here to learn as well. Thank you so much for that. And next, if we can have Dr. Renea introduce yourself. Um, I'm Dr. Renea, and um, well, my full name is Renea Fertiglion. Um, I go by Dr. Renea. I, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I um, am in my office and behind me um, are plants and a black um, desk, the TV, and um, a picture of a man sitting on books um, held up by a hand. I am wearing a blue and white flowered shirt with um, a blue head wrap, um, dark frame glasses. I am chocolate brown. Um, I have on red lipstick and I love silver, so I have on uh, big silver earrings. Um, I have been doing this work, um, mental health work, for over 25 years now. Um, I come to the work by way of uh, just my own experiences. Um, growing up in a um, social, a low social economic um, environment, um, where education and finances and all of that was not um, something that I was uh, privy to, um, and the folk in my neighborhood. Uh, because we had um, quite easy access to substance, substances, alcohol, um, violence. Um, I lost a few people to that environment. I had siblings who um, ended up in, that, in the uh, prison industrial complex um, system. And so um, on my way out of that system because uh, people saw fit to select me out and I am quite aware that I was selected out of that system. Um, I decided that I would uh, really show up because someone saw fit to lift me. And so what I love to do now is to pay that forward. It is my responsibility to pay that forward, to pour into people the love that was given to me. And so what I am so grateful to have the opportunity to be on this panel with such amazing folk. And I am praying that I can do justice. I thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. And I am open to learning. And so I, I look forward to um, just this experience this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. So that rounds out our panelists and let's get started. So the first question is for Vivian. And Vivian, this question is, what does it mean to advance abolition social work? Not just in theory, but actually in practice. And is it possible to incorporate genuinely abolitionist values in this field? Thank you. And thank you so much for everyone and your introductions. I can't wait to hear more. Um, so what it means to advance abolitionist social work <clears throat> is to really uh, reflect, investigate, and then hopefully incorporate abolition into practice from student all the way to whatever field of social work people are going into. 
And the NAASW were also questioning whether social work should even exist, if, if, if social work itself should be abolished um, because of the harm that social, worker has, social work has caused in communities um, historically. Uh, many students that I've encountered in classes or that I'm teaching in field have been negatively impacted by social work. And that's the reason they're going into the field is to make it a better field, to improve the experiences of others who have to interact with social workers for whatever re reason, whether it's in school, whether it's um, in courts, whether it's in service providers and communities. Um, but as some people have spoke, spoken to, oftentimes those social work roles are filled by people who are not part of communities, who are not directly impacted. And so maybe the name social work and what social work does itself should be abolished. That's conversations that we're having and hope to have with lots of other people, including students and other people in the field um, going forward. Um, so in practice, what social, uh, what abolition social work looks like to me is really figuring out what can we undo while we're at work? What can we push up against while we're at work? How can we be, how can we resist and be subver subversive at work? And to ask ourselves when we're caught in an ethical dilemma or what social work would tell us is an ethical dilemma, what's more important to us? Is our license, is our profession, is our job more important to us than liberation? Is it more important to uphold whatever professionalism our what social work tells us to uphold or tells us that is part of being professional? Um, is that more important than working with people towards liberation? Um, and so in practice, I'll give some examples of what it could look like is um, if you are a person who has been told through their job or through social work that you're responsible for calling child welfare services because you have been given the responsibility to determine who is a good parent or not. As my colleague Joyce McMillan would, tell, would say, who is, Joyce is a directly impacted parent, is that we have a choice as social workers. Um, we're told that we're given this responsibility, but we've really been given power. And we need to be more responsible with that power. So is it really for us to determine um, to make that call? Is it really what we want to do as abolitionists, as people who want to decolonize social work, as people who want a more healing space, as people who believe in the equality and freedom of others? So that's one example. If you're faced with making a call, really asking yourself, do I need to make this call? Why do I think I need to make this call? Why do I think that I need um, to exercise the power that I think has been given to me? And so that's, that's one example. I'll pass it along. Thank you for that. Um, curious to know if, if someone would like to add, Jess, would you like to add to that? Um, one of the things that I was thinking about that had a connection for me was that um, I've made really specific decisions to not become a licensed provider. Um, so I, uh, I don't have a clinical mental health degree. My, my work has focused on suicide um, and I've done work in um, systems, lots of the crisis systems specifically, um, and some other suicide prevention spaces, but making a decision not to get, not to pursue licensure was really important to preserving, um, some of the things that I feel like, uh, I should be able to do. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't, um, organizational policies that I think are problematic because there are, but that keeps me from feeling like I have to uphold like values that I don't have. Yeah, thank you for that, Ed. And I think that goes right into our next question um, that I'd love to ask you. So the, the prevailing pr responses to suicide and crisis within the mental health and crisis industry are driven by fear and utilize coercion. Um, so what drives this type of response and what can professionals do instead? Um, I think I wanna start out by just recognizing that I'm going to talk about a few ideas and most of them are not mine. Uh, the work of Black, Brown, and an Indigenous abolitionists um, and disabled advocates really shaped my perspective. And I've been really influenced by critical suicide studies. So 
Uh, so I have a collection of things to talk about, but I don't think they're, there's novel ideas by any means. Um, so first, I think that it's important to just recognize that the state is sanctioning coercion. Um, the state has three kinds of situations in which it's sanctioned, and that's danger to self, danger to others, and grave disability. In most places, they might be defined differently. Um, they're actually very rarely well-defined at all, and um, oftentimes they're you, interpreted in wildly different ways from provider to provider and from organization to organization, um, and organizational policy is often far more conservative than whatever is written in the law um, because they're trying to protect themselves from litigation. So there's just math confusion about the difference between um, instances when clinicians are being required legally to break confidentiality versus, uh, or write a mental health hold or report um, something because it's mandatory. People don't know the difference between any of those things very often, um, and they all get treated as sort of the same standard. So what happens is we um, are treating every instance of crisis as if it meets the standard to violate confidentiality, which is what all of these laws allow us to do. They allow us to violate people's confidentiality. Um, because our society is so litigious, clinicians are just put in positions where they have to decide if they're going to risk their license um, to do something that might be more supportive for their clients. Um, this also forces suicidal people into a risk narrative where they might be considered dangerous or liability. So we're already engaging um, with folks um, who are experiencing that crisis as if there's a problem with them. Um, and you can read more about some of this stuff if you're interested. There's a book called Su uh, Suicide, Foucault, History and Truth by Ian Marsh. The Critical Suicide Now Studies Network has information. Um, Rational Suicide, Irrational Laws is a great book by Susan Stephan. And then there's a book called Decarcerating Disability that all have information that's connected to this. Um, and I can drop all of those book names into the chat um, right now. Um, and then um, in clinical education, so, so this is sort of the way that the law is set up, that in, in clinical education, um, clinical decision-making related to suicide or thoughts of harming others or self-injury is driven by this fear that's instilled by the law and litigation and risk management. Um, instead of a standard of care, so people are not taught in school what the standard of care ought to be for someone who's having experiences with suicide crisis. What they're taught is how to like cover their own um, own liability, um, and they're they're pretty scared usually. So um, there are no national requirements for people to learn anything about supporting suicidal people in their program. So if you're getting a PsyD. Um, I teach an SID program every other semester as an elective, a suicide class. Um, so doctors of psychology that come out of this program don't have to um, know anything about how to treat a suicidal person, and they may or may not be able to get into the class that I teach. Um, and that's pretty typical. A lot of places don't even offer one at all. The vast majority of providers have no idea what they're doing in that area, and it makes them more nervous. Um, and I think there's... Um, for if you're a provider and you're kind of looking for a basic starting off point um, for learning about that, you can check out Helping the Suicidal Person, which is by Stacey Friedenthal. Um, and all of this sort of perspective is based on this idea that suicide is irrational. And if a person is suicidal, it means that something's sort of flawed in their logic or their thinking. Um, and because of that, we have to act in their own interests because they aren't able to. So um, this, this kind of evolves um, because it starts from a place that's like sanity is better than insanity. Um, if, so we are going to privilege sane folks um, and privileging sanity over insanity means that sane people have power and control in our culture. It also means they get to define what is sane. So they get to define themselves. Um, those definitions become more strict over time to preserve intersectional power. Um, sane people get to define reality um, for, uh, for others. They get to um, define it for um, people who are considered insane as well. And this is called epistemic injustice and it happens um, hermeneutically, which is keeping people from accessing 
information about um, themselves or about um, whatever their condition might be, if that's uh, in the case of mental health. And then also testimonial injustice, which says that we're inaccurate reporters of our own experience. And this is where the state gets to intervene um, is because of testimonial injustice. Um, then there's this sort of setup that sane people want to live. And it's not surprising that people who are considered sane want to live because they carry privilege. And the more privilege you have, the more you get to define reality and the more the world is built for you. Of course, we want to live in a world that's built for us. Um, and so, and then we don't understand people who are considered sane don't understand why someone wouldn't want to live in this world. Um, and so because the idea is that sane people want to live, our approach to suicide is to prolong life at all costs. And if we're doing that, that's when really terrible things get to happen to people. Um, because we've cast wanting to die as insane, then we can use external systems of power um, to pull people out of their lives and out of their communities whenever they're having these experiences. Um, and it's, so it's this idea that we have to intervene as, a, as clinicians or as a mental health system, we have to intervene. Um, because wanting to die is a flaw in reasonableness and rationality, we have to do something about it. This also sets up a system where um, survivors or people who have considered suicide have to be thankful for coercion. And, and we have to be thankful for coercion in, in order to avoid more coercive treatment. Um, and so then that sort of reifies the system because we say, thank you for helping me um, because this is the only way that help gets to look um, those systems get um, perpetuated over and over and, and we kind of go about um, this work believing that this is what people want because we require them to say they wanted it and that this help was helpful in order to be considered sane enough to go back in to their communities. Um, I think this is all becoming even more important than it was before because um, we're being, um, we're in the midst of 988 coming. It feels like a a train to me right now, sometimes a train wreck and sometimes something else, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is a new national line um, where people, that's a three digit number um, that's taking the place of the lifeline. And um, I think there's really important work to do in our local communities about crisis response. There's a bunch of different types of crisis response that all get blended together. There's law enforcement response, there's peer support response, there's mental health response and then community-based response. And if we aren't really, really thoughtful about which responses people get, what we end up doing is merging our legal system like 911 um, and 988. And I think that's a really scary thing to have happen. It is that this is a moment when the carceral system could become much, much more involved in what's considered clinical or crisis response. Um, so really um, divesting 988 from 911 is a like critical thing to do right now. And it's something we can advocate for in our communities. Um, as we're starting to consider other ways to sort of liberate our work from coercive interventions, then we have to start as providers by building skills. Because we weren't taught the skills in school that we need, um, we need to look at how to understand our own suicide, our attitudes about suicide and coercion. Make sure we're witnessing resistance in people um, as a good thing and uplifting resistance in our client care. Um, creating containers for people's pain so that they don't have to walk out of the door with it alone. Um, helping people develop networks of support and then having plans to support people when we feel like we've reached the end of our skill set. So we're not just referring directly into um, a system of coercion. Um, and then as providers, we need a solidarity team so we can deal with our own stuff and not just enact it all on clients. So you need to build that team of people who you're going to go to and talk about like what it feels like to let someone walk out of your office who's really thinking about dying instead of calling 911. Um, some other important things I think that we can consider are like unionizing so you can fight against unjust laws and practices. Um, that's really important. You don't have to obey laws that are bad laws. Um, the civil disobedience is a thing. Um, you have to acknowledge the power you have. Not acknowledging power is an abuse of power. So pretending like you're just a victim of the same system that your, your client is a victim of is, is not true. Like we are holding power as people with um, practicing clinical care. 
Um, I also think we can explore things like reparations for things that have happened to people, um, not just monetary, but at the very least, they could include public acknowledgement of things that have gone wrong and um, reimbursement for things like lost wages and lost abilities that people have from psychiatric incarceration. Um, I think we can depart from positivism and empiricism uh, because that has sort of driven our uh, thinking about suicide, but we don't actually have good evidence that our current interventions are effective. Um, even our current um, suicide assessments, the gold standard of suicide assessment is 50% effective at predicting risk. That's really bad. Um, like we shouldn't be considering that a good standard of care. And then to build our entire system off of assessments that can't predict anything, but that also expose people to risk is pretty, pretty problematic. So we can depart from that as a method. Uh, we can divest from systems of pathology where we um, start to understand mental difference through the social model of disability instead of um, a model that's more like pathology. Um, move away from behaviorist measures where we're not actually looking at what does a person who is suicidal do. We look at how does a person who is suicidal feel under our care um, and then not treat suicide as necessarily always the worst possible outcome. Um, like there are other outcomes that might be more difficult for that person and we're not defining them um, in connection with our clients, then, then we really don't know if we're being supportive of someone. Um, and then I think centering lived experience in any of our work is always pretty critical. Uh, I saw that someone said to define the last two isms and I don't know what the last two isms were that I mentioned. So somebody does. I would love to answer that question, but uh, I, I kind of lost my own train of thought, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much for all of that. Um, and as we see in the chat, so many people really agreed with you. Um, this idea of, of this coercion and having us be thankful for the coercion in order um, to actually be released um, is a really critical um, conception that you're, you're talking about. You know, I think this really um, touches back on what Vivian was talking about as well. And I invite Vivian um, to come back and talk a little bit more because you talked about those choices, you know, of making that call. And that's a lot that Jess is talking about now as well, you know, the, of, of how, how do we respond? Um, I mean, I respond just in that way. Uh, some of it is education and Jess, thank you so much. That was so good. And I can't wait to go back and replay that um, for myself. Um, but I, you know, a lot of it is educating other people. A lot, of, a, a lot of it is being that first person that somebody else hears resisting and saying, no, this is not what we're going to do today. No, there are other ways. No, there's other ways of providing care. Like Jess was talking about, 911 and the typical suicide <clears throat> assessments can't be the only way. It's sometimes up to us to come up with those ways or those practices already are already in place from community members who are doing it within the community and not getting not necessarily the credit, but we don't we don't know who they are because they're not being a, they're not being relied upon as quote unquote experts, um, but they are the experts. Um, and then some other things that I that I was going to mention is um, what's really helped me with my practice with my job actually is is following the lead of directly impacted people. I myself have not been arrested. I've had family members who are arrested. I have family members who are incarcerated, but really um, following the lead of uh, formerly incarcerated and directly impacted people who have their own organizations, who have their own practices in the community, whether or not they are social workers or have a license or have a degree of any kind. Those are folks with the lived experiences, as someone else mentions. Those are the people that I need to follow, that I need to hear from. Um, so a lot of the work that I do outside of work and what I encourage others to do is partner with people, volunteer with people, learn from other people, um, because you're not going to get that knowledge from the systems that we work within. Um, I started to practice restorative justice and transformative justice um, restorative justice within my job, because most, most of the time restorative justice is practiced within systems um, and at sometimes co-opted by systems, um, but then learned of transformative justice 
that's existed for generations of people coming together to solve issues outside of systems, um, to figure out what accountability looks like within their, their own communities, within our own communities, um, and really being intentional about build, building that with the communities that we're in, whether it's your friend group, whether that's your block that you live on, whether it's your church group, um, the different communities that we're all a part of, and maybe not engage in that way with folks around how, when an issue comes up between us, when a real harm has been caused, how are we gonna come together and not call the police and not rely on a court system and not um, look to people who will most definitely punish us to come in and try to figure out who's right and who's wrong, when in a lot of situations we're all right and we're all wrong and we need to all have our voices heard about what it means to, to resolve issues. Um, I also come to this work as a survivor of intimate partner violence. So for me, it's, it's a very personal thing also of if I'm going to say I'm an abolitionist in my public defender work and I'm an abolitionist as a restorative and transformative justice practitioner in the, in the world, then I've had to not call the police. I've had to tell myself, this is not what you want for your life or for your child or even for that other person. Um, so that is something that I've resisted and even going to court is like, I have to figure out a different way in my mind to wrap around like, what is the future going to look like? How can I sit and be patient for time to pass for, for all of us to grow in different ways so that our futures can be different for our child? Um, so it's a very personal thing and also a professional thing. And I'm also just, just also as a, as a person trying to figure out how to live all of these things in a way that I haven't before. So I don't, I don't come to this as, as a lifelong abolitionist. I found about abolition by reading uh, Angela Davis book one day in my twenties. And I was like, well, this makes sense. And then over time learned more and more, but I didn't have unfortunately, the people around me to guide me in that way. And fortunately, I do know people now, and now I know all the folks on this panel that I can learn from as well. So I just for the people who are coming to this new, and it feels new, and it feels like it might produce some anxiety, or you don't know, or it's just unsettling. It does take time to kind of incorporate, it, it can take time to kind of incorporate the values into your own life and into your own work. Yeah, thank you so much for that. You know, and I think that's, Perfect um, lead in, I would invite Erica um, to please join because the question I think really touches on what's been said so far about lived experiences. So the, the question that I have for you is even therapists with shared identities and lived experience with their clients can enact harm by being complicit in systems of oppression and implementing frameworks that locate disorder within the individual while ignoring the social and political context and the conditions. How can we prepare mental health practi practitioners to move beyond holding identities and create meaningful and radical partnerships with the people they work with? Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jess and Vivian. I was just, I was getting my whole life, those last comments. Um, I, I really appreciate this question because the where I want to start is that it is my belief that queer and trans people of color are the best thing happening in the mental health field. I think that the particular intersections that we sit at, the particular questions that we have to ask to even navigate these systems as practitioners and as folks who are receiving care, um, force us to be in some critical conversations that um, other folks might not be a part of. And so... I think that we're the best thing happening and just being from a community does not give you expertise to work in that community, right? Because what we know is that we're not all the same. And so I know in my experiences as a practitioner, I often worked in um, institutions and agencies that did not know how to work with folks who were most impacted by structural violence. And they were like, you're black and you're queer. So why don't you go out there and help the black people and the queer people? And then we don't have to look at um, our practices, we don't have to look at our policies. And that tokenization can sometimes become a way for us to not do our own work, to look at the ways that we are representing these systems that are hurting our people and also hurting us. So if we start there, that we're, we have brilliance that's 
and wisdom connected to our lived experience, but we also have brilliance and wisdom connected to a host of other things. Um, I think it opens up an opportunity and conversation for us to do our best work. So, you know, the training that I received in my social work program, it left a lot to be desired. You know, it was a long time ago. I hope things have changed, but it was deeply problematic. And I actually intentionally asked my organizing comrades to be a counsel and support of accountability for me around my values, because I knew that for me to hold on to those values and for me to, um, go into a process where I'm being socialized and educated, um, it would be really easy to actually start to, to think and believe the way I was trained. And honestly, the interventions that I learned, I mean, I, I definitely learned things that were useful, but the majority of what I learned was at best irrelevant and at worst harmful. And so going in with a critical mind and going in with a deep understanding that like cultural competency is not going to save us. That is not what I wish for our people. That, that is not the utopia um, that I'm moving towards. Because what does it matter if you understand my culture, if you do not understand the legacies of violence and harm and the social and political context that I'm navigating day to day, right? Um, so, for me, one of the big questions is how do we hold the, the context and conditions of the lives, specifically of queer and trans people of color in my work, while also understanding that each person has their own unique relationship to that context and to those conditions. And so it really calls us to not get comfortable. Um, it really calls us towards a kind of rigor that we really need because these models are very basic and they're stale and they're outdated you know, they don't actually work really for anyone. And we have to create our own ways of doing this work. And we have to actually recenter all of who we are. And so, you know, I have a tension around my professional identity as a therapist, because I'm like, if I just like rested into that, it not only would it not feel good to me, but it would really cut me off from all of this other knowledge and wisdom that I have cultivated in communities and in systems of care that were outside of the mainstream mental health system. So a lot of times my beginning assumption is that therapists and social workers are not gonna be helpful because honestly, that's been my direct experience as someone who's tried to receive care. Um, and that's also been the experience of countless people that I've talked to and we're in a different moment now. And so I feel really excited about being able to support the development of queer and trans mental health practitioners of color. And also really thinking about the difference between identity and understanding structural violence and oppression. Not only are we you know, capable of harm, responsible for harm, but we often represent systems um, of harm that we didn't create, but we're the representative, right? And so I don't assume that folks are gonna trust me in my work because I'm black, because I'm trans, because I'm queer. I, I, and if people extend that trust to me without doing their due diligence, I ask them to fall back. I'm like, it's okay for you to take your time to find out if I'm trustworthy, right? That, that we should not automatically assume, especially someone in power um, is just someone to extend trust to. So some of the ways that, that this looks in my work is really questioning everything and moving very boldly towards contradictions. We need, we need abolitionist practitioners everywhere. So if you're in institutions, um, it's really important that you are moving change forward in the ways that you can, but to make sure to not do that alone. Um, I know I got burnt out plenty of times thinking that I was gonna you know, organize uh, my managers and supervisors only to find out, you know, you, you can't do that by yourself, especially when you're targeted in these systems. So for me, really the, the answer to all of this is healing justice as a framework. I stopped doing my work in the context of the like mental health framework or therapy framework a long time ago, because it sets you up to be a savior. And it also sets you up to just really be complicit with structural violence and oppression.
all of that. <laughs> so, so powerful. And as you see in the chat, um, so many people um, are in alignment with what you're saying and saying yes. And, and your words are so healing. Um, I invite all of the panelists uh, to come on back, uh, to come on screen. Uh, Cause I have a question that kind of falls right into this. And that question is, so we're talking about these practices. We're talking about the schooling and, and what, what does that look like? You know, um, like Erica just, sh just uh, shared with us is that the training itself is problematic. So when we're thinking about that training being problematic, we need to think about what the training is based off of. So with that, how do you see popular evidence-based practices as upholding white supremacist values and enacting control in pursuit of normal? Can any of these approaches be adapted to serve clients in pursuit of healing and liberation? And that's to all of you. What are your thoughts? Hi, this is Arisha. Um, I think with all of these like evidence-based practices, like we have to think about like who's conducting the scientific research, right? And what's the intent? So, cause historically, even most recently, most of the practices are conducted by white people and mostly white males on populations that they are not a part of. And most likely are used, I think Erica hinted at this, the academic use or to like justify the pathologies in like urban and poor communities. So I'm always wondering, like, who's conducting these practices because they are usually upheld by white supremacist values, and they don't benefit the people that it's practiced on. So I only see these practices useful in identifying, like, the gaps in the knowledge base and where we can move forward in addressing, like, people's actual needs. Um, I do know of, like, Black psychologists, um, like Dr. Faye Belgrave and Dr. Michael McCreary, who I study under at VCU and um, they've done a lot of research around using like culturally competent evidence-based practices um, in black communities. And a lot of their research kind of disrupt this whole notion um, of treating, of healing and treatment like uh, that doesn't exist in like the singular model, uh, which is not something that black people, indigenous people are used to in terms of healing. And their work really focuses on how we heal and treat people within the community. So I think those types of evidence-based practices are helpful when we talk about healing and liberation. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was very powerful. What are other thoughts? Anyone else like to add anything to that? I think it's I think it's just really important to recognize, like even within the the sort of guidelines of what's considered. Um, of what like is considered evidence-based we don't actually have very many things that like meet sort of the the research standards that are already built on white supremacist values uh, so like within the field we're not even meeting the standards of white supremacy to begin with so we could just abandon that altogether um, and start looking at practice-based evidence which i think is much much more useful so like what is working in our communities and how do we replicate that in ways that are meaningful to people. Absolutely, and, and, and I, I like how you phrase that, the practice-based evidence, right? And so what, are, what do some of those things look like? When we think about these models that we see within communities that are working, that are healing, but are outside of those, those box scoped, what comes to mind for you all? What kind of um, healing practices maybe do you engage in that's maybe outside of that box? You know, many of the communities that I belong to, that I'm a part of, we have long legacies of ecosystems of care. And so I always assume that somebody that I'm working with has strategies. So we start there, we name them. Um, and when folks are like, I don't have any, I'm like, you were sitting here having this conversation with me, you, you have survived. And so how do we actually um, surface the things that you're already doing, surface the things that are ex accessible to you in your community. But I think the danger 
with evidence-based models, in addition to them just not being effective, is that anytime you are being prescriptive around someone's healing, to me, that feels like an act of violence because you really have to be in deep consent. And so I know for myself, I'm trained in a lot of different things because I actually want to have a really robust toolbox so that, it, you know, okay, sure. I know about CBT. There, there are plenty of things that I've been trained in that are useful in particular contexts with consent. And then there are things where I'm like, I don't think this will ever work for the communities I'm, that I'm a part of. But self-determination means I could be working with someone who's like, you know, I actually would really like it if we did some CBT in this session. So being able to be flexible and not getting too attached to any one way of healing. Um, and also really understanding that, you know, therapy is a way. And there are a lot of um, healing crises that I've had for which therapy was actually not it. Um, therapy would have had me probably going around and around a little bit longer than I would have liked. Um, and people know what they need, right? And people have an innate uh, wisdom and ability to heal. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. And also reminds me of when we're looking at the full mind body therapies, right? Really looking at somatic therapies. What does that look like in our communities? Being able to engage in things that are ancestral, you know, really those traditional healing circles, looking at sound and energy healing, looking at Reiki, you know, looking at all of these other indigenous practices that may not necessarily fall under the guise of some of those evidence-based models, but they're actually, from what I see, sometimes relabeled, um, <laughs> you know, and, and co-opted often. There's a lot of ind indigenous practices that are co-opted and created and, and called another name. So would anyone like to, to comment on that? We still have a, a few moments to, you know, what does that look like that you see within your practices? And are people able to engage freely in these other holistic practices? When I practice circles <clears throat> at my job as a public defender, um, I mean, it's definitely, I started, I started circle keeping in 2014 for a case and realized through that case and using that as a tool that that's not what it was meant for. It wasn't meant for this like the end, the means to an end or the product or like, this is the way that somebody says sorry very quickly. Um, and so when I do them at my work now at, as a public defender, if somebody asked me to do it, um, it's very important that I center my client as a person who's been harmed by a system and not as a practice that's a, this person caused harm, this person is the recipient of that person's harm and that's what we're gonna talk about. We talk about all of us as a community sitting there, what brought us there together. Um, sometimes it still feels like this is for something and I try to make it not for that something as much as I can by either limiting the people who are there or saying we're not definitely not recording this. Um, there's not gonna be a, a finished product unless the people who are there decide that they want a finished product of some kind. Um, but we're just, we're here to talk. Um, and then I, when I think about outside of systems, I think about groups like HALA in New York City that, you know, you don't hear HALA uplifted all the time unless you're in certain circles because they really are doing the work in their community. They really are bringing healing justice to their community. They're not going around saying, these are our wares, we are selling them. They are truly connecting with, with who they are in community already with. Um, so there's that, there's that also of, of being a providing or um, being in healing, um, excuse me, in healing um, modalities, I guess you would say, with the people that you're already in community with. Are you inserting yourself or are you already a part of that? Um, and that's what, I mean, it took me also some time to learn that of like, no, you can't just go around and say, I think you need a healing circle, let me provide. But more of like, who is it, who's asking me to do this and why? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and it's really, it comes back to us being able to, to push the boundaries, 
right, to really be able to connect with our clients, as everyone has said um, so far, of being able to connect and meet people where they are, where, which may look very different for different people, you know, so even offering something, you know, like hip hop therapy, which is something that I do, which is a creative arts form of therapy, really looking at narrative, looking at that, um, the, the stories that people have, but that's not something that's mainstream either but it incorporates all of those other pieces, the bilateral stimulation that you see in some of these evidence-based models, you know, looking at, um, like we said, with narrative, also looking at ciphers. That's actually another form of group therapy. So for all of us, I think just even to be educated in all of the other options that are out there for us to be able to engage in a really meaningful way um, that creates spaces of healing. Um, and with that, Irisha, I'd love to move on to a question for you. So many note the ways mainstream mental health gaslights individuals, downplaying the impact of intergenerational trauma, resulting from ongoing oppression such as racism, patriarchy, and poverty. How can clinicians balance the need to acknowledge systemic harm while also empowering clients to make changes that may support their individual well-being. Thank you, Jackie. That's such a good question. Just want to preface this. There are children playing outside. So if you hear screams, no one is hurt. People are actually having fun. <laughs> um, I guess just in case people have never heard the term intergenerational trauma, I just want to Kind of define is like it's a concept that helps explain years of like generational challenges within like families and groups and the psychological effects that like collective trauma impacts that group of people and like subsequent generations, right? So I definitely think clinicians need to understand the ways in which generational trauma and these long histories of like socially sanctioned abuse um, impacts people's overall health. So for like many years, I used to be a doula, a birth worker. And I used to always tell my clients how every woman develops the egg she carries while in her mother, right? So your mother developed the egg she carries while her mother. And if you have a daughter, she would develop her egg while inside of you. So that means that we are holding generations of trauma in our body that we are not even aware of, right? So I think any mental health practitioner and clinician needs to have that understanding that we are helping people heal the known and the unknown. Um, because most times people can't name the traumas that they are feeling. They just know that they do not feel safe within their body. Um, and then when you are a person with many intersections of like being a woman or being trans and poor, you are uh, more impacted by this system. Um, because I personally think most of our mental health issues come from being impacted by this system. Um, so I feel like if your therapist or clinician is not addressing these things in your session, then that's not, um, that's not your person, right? And just a, just a quick side note, uh, I want people to understand that you are in a relationship with your therapist. Um, so you can leave at any time, just like any, any other relationship. Um, but I think as clinicians, we can support um, and empower our clients to make those changes by focusing on the individual person and the importance of their unique experiences while still a part of their community, right? So in many of our families, um, like a lot of things get passed down. And if it doesn't serve our clients, um, we can empower our clients to know that they can do the work to stop these things right now. And you no longer have to pass those things down to the next generation. Um, because we all have this commonality as a people, and we, but we all are still like very different. So like, even though we're healing generations of trauma, um, your individual experience is very important to you. So I think as clinicians, we can empower people in knowing that like, yes, while you have went through some very, very difficult things are still are going through some very difficult things. Um, and yes, you have been uh, and are impacted by systematic intergenerational trauma. And yes, you can still love your family. You are still your own person on your own healing and life journey. And in spite of, you can still heal and thrive and make good choices 
um, that will impact your life for the greater good. So, yeah. Thank you for that. You've hit so many different marks, you know, especially this idea of mental health issues themselves can come from the systems. Um, is there anyone that would like to, to touch on that idea? And actually, you know what, I invite all of the panelists to come on back and, and let's dive into this. Let's have that conversation. Um, so let, let's go ahead to the next question. And this is for everyone. Um, how do you navigate ethical conflicts that may arise in your work, All right? So we're talking about, you know, mental health issues in the system and how it's impacted. And everyone's talked about that. So, you know, are there um, ways that you've creatively modified the tools and practices you um, might be required to use to comply with your professional role? So how, how do you bob and weave? Right? How do we get around that? Since we've talked about a lot of these practices, they may be evidence-based, but, but by who and for who? So how do you navigate that? And this is for any of you. Um, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do in our, um, our telephonic crisis work is to be very, very explicit about defining when um, things get employed. So when something like a welfare check um, is, is like legally required to happen or contractually required to happen, um, being very, very explicit about what imminent risk means um, and putting a number of hours and, and what the standard is for thinking that someone um, is going to harm themselves or someone else. So being really, really explicit about laws that are designed to be vague um, in order to sort of move us toward coercion. I wanna create processes that move us away from coercion. And then on the other side of that, creating a process where people have to look back at what they did. So anytime someone's calling 911 as an intervention, they should be looking back on that work and thinking about what could I have done differently that wouldn't have brought more risk to this situation. Um, I've also defined risk assessments as like a risk assessment that you do uh, about that person's risk level, but you're also going to define the risk that you are bringing into the situation as a provider. Um, so you don't get to be neutral in this and we don't get to smooth these things over. Those ethical concerns that come up in our work are gonna be right on the surface in the moment when we're doing the work. I love that you don't get to be neutral, right? There's this accountability that's there. I love that. What are some other thoughts? How do you navigate this? I, I, I think this question um, would have probably been different for me in like my second year in the, this field versus my 12th year. Because I think when you're new to the field, you might feel a sense of like the of navigating like ethical conflicts, right? Because you're so brand new and you may feel if you do that you may fear, you have this fear of like being fired. Um, so I definitely know that feeling as a new clinician, but as I continue in this field, I would feel like ethically I'm running up against how do I handle, handle things more ethically against a system with like very little ethics, right? So I've worked in children's services almost all of the years that I've been in this field and I've conducted a lot of family therapy. Um, and there have been times when, according to the book, I was supposed to report families to DHS for minor things like, you know, the children's clothes smell like these. But I think over time in this field, you figure out how to use yourself as the resource help people because you know how vicious this system is for black people she's like mother but like your heat might be off because you can't afford it not because you're a horrible parent so like instead of reporting that maybe i could make some phone calls to help so i think it's a matter of how can i struggle against the ethics of the system while also um simultaneously working in it yeah so important any other thoughts on this topic I, I have um, some thoughts around that, Jackie, and especially working um, inside captivity with, with women who are in prison. Um, you know, there are a lot of rules and, and um, stuff that they have to follow in there. And one of the things that I say going through the door is one, within, with respect, and um, I'm not a rule follower. I call outside the lines all the time. And so one of the things that I am very 
um, aware of when we go into that system is that there are a lot of women who haven't been hugged in a healthy way. Women who have not been told that they are worthy of greatness, that the thing happened to them that it is not them. And so when I began to go in there and pour into that system, excuse me one second, I knew that was going to happen. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Sorry, I knew it was going to happen. Um, and so um, that, that's one of the things that I, I'm very conscious of, is those systems that are there are there fractured. And so um, my job when I go in there is not to have this, this mask of I can do everything and I'm going to follow their rules, but rather I need to pour into you, sis, in a way that these folk in here don't see you, nor do they want to pour into you. And so I, um, I try to, um, from an ethical standpoint, and, and being careful within that environment because I mean, it could be tricky when you have the COs and all of that watching your every move, how you show up. And so the other thing that I do is try to build a relationship with those COs that are there too, because guess what? They're, for the most part, black and brown bodies, just like those who are in captivity there. So they're living that same experience, but because they get a paycheck, they try to show up differently. And so I just try to educate when I go in. On all of it. Yeah, so powerful, you know, and this idea of being able to navigate um, some of this is really being able to pour in how we're able to pour into to those that we're working with. But anyone else like to add to this as well? How do we duck and dodge, you know, some of these these antiquated rules that really perpetuate harm rather than protect um, the individuals, actually protects the sanctity of these harmful systems, right? What are some other thoughts? You know, I've been thinking a lot about the paper trail that many of us are responsible for creating for folks um, in my role as clinical supervisor. Shout out to Rise Youth Center in Richmond, California. Um, you know, we've been having conversations about um, what these documents mean. And, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in asking questions about the risk when we're not in these roles anymore. And what does it mean to have people ask for their charts, right? We've all read notes from therapists and practitioners and been like, wow, you actually really have disdain for this person you were expected to help. Um, how are we moving towards, you know, if you're working in a system where you have to engage with insurance, how are you using the least stigmatizing diagnoses? How are you having conversations with people um, about what is in their documentation so that they know and they can, they can influence um, what is said about them, right? And so I think that ethics are so essential, but I have my own ethical standards that are actually quite higher than the ones that were handed to me by the code of ethics um, for social workers to Arisha's point. It's like, how are you going to hold me accountable to some ethics and you have not, right? Um, but I do think this piece around documentation, assessments, really explaining why we're doing this. And also some of the, the things that I was trained to do, they didn't feel useful until I built my own relationship to them. And so um, how do we allow these tools to also be useful for the folks we're working with. Like we don't own any of this. Yeah, so I, I hear you loud and clear. It's about being able to hand over the power, right? Because even what I'm hearing you saying is um, even this collaborative you know, conversation around what is in these documents? Like what does your chart even say? And making sure that people are aware of that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, those additions from all of you. Um, now I have a question for Renee, kind of really piggybacking on all this, talking about power and talking about autonomy. What tools do you center? Um, do you use to center the autonomy of people impacted by the criminal uh, justice system, um, or as we refer to as a captivity? 
um, including incarceration, mandated treatment, probation, and parole requirements, and all those other things. And what advice would you give professionals to prevent re-traumatizing these individuals? So, um, so let me start by saying that um, I am not an orthodox um, or I am an unorthodox practitioner. I, um, yes, I, I have the degree behind my name, those initials, initials behind my name. Um, I just want to just um, circle back to something Jess said in terms of the, the licensing and, and all of that. And I'm a strong believer that just for me, I don't feel like um, that's a requirement for the work that I do. However, um, I, I know that it's important. I'm not saying that it's not important. I want to um, get everything in my toolbox that I could possibly use or utilize to help um, the, the people who come into my path. And so some of the reasons why I, I, I truly don't believe in that um, licensing system is because it it kind of pushes people out or, or, or locks people up, lock people out of the, of the process. I mean, brilliant minds, people with lived experience, people who could turn our world upside down because of their experiences, but because they didn't have the, the ability to get the license or the education or they didn't have the money or they didn't have the, whatever the it is, they didn't have all of that they're not able to show up in some of those rooms. And I think that it, it, it prevents a lot of folk, it, it stops folk. So that's my whole issue around the license. And again, please don't mishear me. I think it's important for, for some folk, but I also think it keeps us um, in captivity. It keeps us limited. And so I, I, dig I digress, I, I, I digress about that. Um, so what I was talking about was just being an unorthodox um, person and, and the way that I show up in the work that I do. Um, I really try to bring my whole self to the experience um, um, because I, I, I feel like that a lot of us struggle because of the education we have that says when you do this work, you are to fit in this box and you need to stay in this box. And this is the way we want you to operate. And once you step outside of that box, then you're no longer doing what that license or whatever the thing is that requires you to do. And so I um, think it's real important for me to um, one, show up in my love, show up in my greatness, and, and really begin to build relationships with folk. And the reason why, especially in the black, brown and indigenous communities, it, that's, what we, that's what we have, right? We show up and we build relationships. We've been doing this from day one. Um, we've been doing it with each other, for each other in our communities. And then, you know, there was a shift where people told us this is the way we had to show up. And in showing up that way, we lost a lot. And so that's, you know, when I talk about being unorthodox, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I am not afraid as uh, uh, um, to, to be vulnerable when I show up with my, my clients because I feel like if we are going to do this work and we're going to be true to this thing, we have to give up something, y'all. We have to give up something in order to get those folk to see us so that they can trust the process, so that they can begin to, to if you will, peel back some of those layers of, of trauma that they've been impacted with. Why should they give us anything? How can we help them to heal if we can't be true to ourselves, if we can't be honest with our own stuff? And so for me, um, that that whole thing is is real important for me to be able to show up um, for real, not with the plastic, not with the book stuff, not with the stuff that they 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 taught us, 
behind those um, behind those bricks and, and mortar and that higher education system. But really, if you want to do some healing, show up to do the work. And so my biggest tools, I, I, I think, in centering um, the autonomy is, um, is basic. Is, is basic for me. It's about healing justice. It's about love, my you know, like unconditional love, just being able to show up and seeing people in their humanity, seeing them not as a dollar sign, not, you know, someone who, oh, you, you're just a number, like really no judgment, um, meeting people at their expectation. And that's important to me. A lot of people say, yeah, you know, but what does that mean, meeting them at their expectation? Because for me, I might go in, not your own expectations, I might go in with this expectation and that's not where they are. Like, let's be real with each other. Let's, let's allow them to do the work. Because one of the things I say to them is like, listen, I can't do it for you. We can do this together. I'm a strong believer that what you need is inside of you. We just have to figure out how to make that work for you. Now, how does it show up? What kind of tools do I use to, to make that happen? A variety. How dare I think that one type of, if you will, therapeutic milieu will help every last one person? Well, that's that's old school, you know. And I am a psychologist, and you know, Freud and Erickson and 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 all of those old white dudes with with you know their experiences cannot equate to what my folk go through every single day walking this planet. So. Um, I, I like movement. In my, in my youth, I was a recreation therapist. And so I love to play. And I think in playing, you can learn a lot. So dancing, um, meditation, movement, movement. I like to do right brain, left brain stuff, relationship building. Like all of these are tools that I have in my toolbox that I think that we can utilize to bring people to the work that they need to do to heal themselves. Um, and do I have another second? Okay. Um, and so it, I, I, I really believe, yes, I do CBT. I, I think that's important. However, we have to understand how that shows up for black and brown and indigenous people, especially um, low, social e low social economic folk, right? We can't show up with our middle class selves and, and, and our communities and try to wear that hat. Like, no, turn your hat around, show up and meet them right there. And so that's, that's important to me. I use drawings with them, psychoeducational work with, with my clients, anything that's going to get them to come outside the box. And it's not always talking because when you start talking, you're all up in my business and I'm not trying to give you that kind of business. So that's one of the things that, you know, I, I, while it's important, I think we have to get to the point where we're talking, that's not where I start. So I will go anywhere um, within a realm that's going to tap into their, their ability to show up in their greatness. And that's where, that's where I am. That's where I start. Thank you. Yeah. So <laughs> in the chat, people are saying, you know, I'm so with you. This is so validating. Um, and I say to you, Ashe, um, and as a play therapist, yes, play therapy is so healing. Um, and we're seeing that in the chat as well. It is a way for us to really be able to connect, um, especially like you said, when, when words aren't enough, right? So I invite all of the panelists, please come on back on screen and I have a couple more questions for all of you. Um, so many questions, <laughs> but we only have time for a few. Um, so one is, how do you see the relationship between ending involuntary psychiatric commitment and decarceration, decarcera uh, can't we get it out, I'm sorry, I'm so excited, decarceration overall. So let me read that again. How do you see the relationship between ending voluntary psychiatric commitment and decarceration overall? What are your thoughts? Do you think it's possible? Is it possible 
for us to decarcerate care. I think it's possible. Um, and, and just like abolition, it takes us to imagine a world without these things to begin to start talking about what it looks like without these things. And I don't think any of us have lived in a world without the existence of prisons. Um, and so it's uh, hard to imagine a world without prisons, but it is possible. Things have changed over time. I think things take time. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, but the relationship between involuntary psychiatric commitment and decarceration, they're completely intertwined. I mean, I prisons have become involuntary psychiatric commitment. It just depends on what's happening and, and who's going um, and who's going where and what kind of care they have out in the community and, and care not, you know, it's care, it can be called care. It can be called, is there racism in this person's life? Is there oppression in this person's life or not? Um, I'm kind of like talking as I'm thinking, but there's like so many images swirling in my mind of like, it, it's not even like, does this person have a caring family or not? It's just, how are we responding to people um, who are in pain, who, who want healing, who want to talk about the things that are troubling them about themselves, but can't because it means going to jail. Um, like Jess was talking about, it means how, how do we approach someone who wants to harm themselves is it the worst thing in the world that they want to harm themselves? Is there a way to talk to folks in a way that's not shaming or not saying like everything you're thinking about the world or yourself is wrong and we want to correct that. Um, so I think it's like, it's like this reimagination that a lot of people talk about. It's, it's, it's reimagining a lot of different things and, and, it's, and it also starts with us as individuals of changing the way we think about things because even though, um, I'll speak for myself, like I, like I said before, like I can talk about abolition all day. I can talk about why I want the people I work with to be out of prisons, why prisons should be burned down, why all of these things should happen. But if I'm my mind, I'm still thinking of, oh, I, how am I going to get back to, to that, at that person who wronged me? How am I going to, if I still have like this policing that I'm doing of other people in my head, of whoever, of fellow professionals, like, oh, they're not doing that right. I'm going to call them out. If I still am thinking those things, I'm still living with a police state in my head of where I've called myself an authority and now I'm the judge of what's right and what's wrong. But a lot of mixed bag of thoughts, but that's where I'll start. I agree with Vivian. I think you make some really good points. Um, I think it's a matter of prioritizing uh, people over these things. Um, your question, Jackie, made me think of the Walter Wallace Jr. case in Philadelphia, where I believe like his own family and community had called um, the police because he was having a mental health um, issue and he had a knife and he was murdered by the police. And I think as a community, like we as a clinicians need to um, build up a therapeutic alliance in our communities where people feel supported in using these other models of care as opposed to calling the police. We haven't gotten there yet, or even close. I'm kind of like Vivian. I don't know if I will see that in my lifetime either. But I and I think it's going to take some time and commitment from from us. Um, it's going to take a lot of psychoeducation and um, and examples that this can actually work. Because I know most Black and Brown people distrust police, but they often feel as if they have like no other options um, when situations happen. Um, like the Walter uh, Wallace situation. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Any other thoughts around this? It's a tough one. I think, I think that it's really useful for us to sort of think about any steps, any steps that we're taking toward um, abolition, both, ought to include both psychiatric abolition and um, like criminal carceral system abolition. Um, but I, I think it's also important that as we're looking toward reform, because the steps between here and abolition can include like revolution or reform or both at the same time. Um, I think everybody should try all the strategies. Um, and in between, if we're taking steps, we have to make sure that we're not doing 
reformist reforms, that we're doing abolitionist reforms that are moving toward actual abolition. And so that we're not putting reforms in place that just sort of smooth over um, and, and reinforce the carceral system. Uh, so I think critical resistance has has a, a document that talks about this related to policing specifically, we think it would be useful for us to start thinking more broadly about what does it look like to do abolitionist steps around psychiatric incarceration um, and uh, other parts of the psychiatric system. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Um, so many other thoughts and questions, um, but I really want to get to this last question. And I think this is a really important one for all of us. So what advice would you give to mental health clinicians working in environments where client agency is restricted and where they might risk consequences for pushing back against the status quo? How can they care for self and clients in a situation where they are asked to work in ways that compromise their personal values? Yeah, seeing some heads nod. What are your, what are your thoughts? What are your reactions to that? I know that um, not everyone is where I am in terms of thinking outside the box. I, I, I and, and of course, it, I think it's because I'm older that I feel like I can push back a little. Um, I will show up in my greatness. I will challenge in a respectful way. Um, those folk who are um, attempting to put me in the box. Um, and, and so it's really hard to say, Jackie, um, because if you're afraid to lose your job, if you're afraid to lose your source of income, then unfortunately there are times that we show up in, in places where, where we're uncomfortable and we do that dance. Um, but if we can hold each other accountable to this work and to healing and to love, I, I think it's okay to, to push back in a respectful way, to show up in a way that, say, that says, you know, this is the work that we're doing and it's about healing. Um, so I, I just don't believe in like the whole cookie cutter treatment modality. And so I'm at a place in my life where if we're going to do the work, I, I need to be real and true in my authentic self and show up and, and do the work. And sometimes it is scary because you, you know, if you're relying on that income and you're not working for yourself, you, you do that. I think this risk conversation is so important because <clears throat> a lot of the practitioners I'm in community with, you know, nobody just handed me my license. Like, in fact, there were many white women who tried to sabotage my career at this point. Um, and so to actually ask people to be in an assessment around what's the, the level of risk they're willing to take and to think about risk really broadly, because sometimes it's about losing your job. Sometimes it's about your reputation. Sometimes it's about liability. Um, and also really thinking about what is the risk associated with following the rule, right? That that's up for question. Um, but I think these are um, very individual decisions that we have to make, but in a collective context, because I know that I'm willing to take certain risks because my assumption as a black practitioner, as a queer and trans practitioner, I'm, my assumption is that someone's gonna come for my things. Like I just assume that to be the case. Um, and so I have plans B through Z if that should happen so that I can have coins in my bank account, you know, so I can take care of myself. Um, but I get to make those decisions based on my specific situation. And there are other folks who, who can't take those kinds of risks. And so how do we collectivize risk also? Um, I also think there's, there's above ground strategies and there's underground strategies. Now, I, I know, you know, back in the day when I was doing case management work, 
that work is so relational because the rule might be you have to have these requirements, but you got so-and-so's phone number, you they know what's good and a no turns into a yes. And so I think that um, we can be super creative with how we push back. And some of the pushback that we're already doing is not something that people know about. Um, and so to just like, expand what is possible in terms of the choices that we make like everything that we do in this work is a choice point and you could probably think of a more abolitionist way to move forward with any particular action and it doesn't have to be grand you know i think something i learned is like know what you know what you can change and what you can't change actually as an individual know what you can and can't change um collectively and know at what point you might not be able to stay in a situation because of your ethics and values. But the, the ethical dilemma should, nev should never disappear, right? Even in my work now, you know, it's, it's all work where I get to create the context and conditions. I get to work with brilliant people who have similar values and we push each other, but I still have ethical dilemmas because the whole point is that we have to be asking these questions constantly. I agree with Erica. I think there is a moral obligation to always do what's right, even when you are scared. Um, just so we don't risk this causing more harm um, in a system that already causes a lot of harm. Um, I would say that a lot of times you usually are not the only one thinking these things, right? So there are communities like of other like radical thinking clinicians to organize with and just try to find those people so you won't feel so vulnerable unprotected out here. When I heard your question, Jackie, I, I thought a lot about just the self-care that clinicians and mental health professionals need to take for themselves. Like, I'm a big person on promoting self-care, and I always feel like even within the system, you should always prioritize yourself first in your mental health in all situations. Um, because I think sometimes going against these big systems can overwhelm us, and it can cause you more distress and Sometimes can have you give up completely from doing this work. So I'll I'll always say trust your instincts um, and go with it. Right. Um, yeah. I think um, there's a lot of room for white women to be in front of taking more public risk about this. Um, as like, I think there are lots and lots of white women in the field who use. Um, liability and things like that as a shield to keep them from doing the right thing by their clients. And uh, we got to stop that. Um, I think that's a really important that we start understanding the difference between um, what the risk is to me and what the risk is to my client. Um, if, if we're coming from that position, I think that's really, really critical. Um, and then um, have some have some willingness to uh, to take on some risk if if you're going to to work with people who are experiencing things that that are exposing them to the all of the terrible parts of the system that we have upheld you know for centuries um because like it's our responsibility as white folks like we built this problem it's our responsibility as white folks to do things about that um and we like we don't get to be complicit in, in, in the ways um, that we are. So, um, and like any time that we are placing our own fear of like litigation, which almost never happens, it almost never happens. It's so rare. Like nobody know. I don't know anyone who knows anyone that's ever been sued, um, for like, for this stuff. So like, we have to start coming from a place of like accountability for the systems that we built, I think. Um, and so, and, and I think other folks here have different perspectives than me for lots of reasons, uh, but I think race is a huge part of that. And um, it's important that we go into this work with our eyes open about the power dynamics and know exactly what risks we're willing to take and what we're not. And then if us not being willing to take a risk puts our client at risk, we need to find them someone else who can help them because we can't anymore. And even if you are sued, that's a conversation starter also. I mean, it coming to litigation is like, okay, now we can have this conversation out in the open in a courtroom and talk about how 
professionals or people in care services really feel and what's really going on out here um, if, if, if uh, litigation is your form of publicity. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it is. Um, they definitely do it when they're prosecuting people. They make this big hullabaloo in media and you know, so why not? It can work the other way around. Um, I think I'll just add, I agree with, with, with what folks said, but I'll just add that um, it also is useful to have people around you that, that do think like you. It's useful to have people that disagree with you to challenge you and get you to think of other things, but it's useful to have a community of care around you. There's definitely other public defender social workers that I am not in community with because we do not think about the work in the same way. Um, there are definitely, um, public defender lawyers that I'm not in community with because we are not looking at public defense work in the same way. So if you can find others who are thinking like you, who are trying to push boundaries like you, that's your team. You can work together. Um, the more of you working, you don't have to go at it alone. You can you can build um, a group around you. That's what NAASW, what we're trying to do together is kind of uh, bound, bind ourselves together and, and um, have some words about what's happening in social work. Yeah, any other thoughts around this? I mean, I think this is such an important topic. Um, we still have a few more minutes, even just around how do you care for yourself? As you're doing this important, very difficult work that we're all talking about, how do you care for yourself? As Arisha said, we have to center uh, that self-care. It must be a priority um, or we're not gonna be good to anybody. Um, and in fact, if we don't prioritize that self-care, we can wind up being burned out, not realize it and actually do more harm. Um, so what are some tips? Uh, does anyone have a, a few tips of what are some quick ways to be able to care for yourself in, in, in some of these spaces? And I'll just blow, I, I'll, I'll throw out one um, that I have that I tell everyone, go to the dollar store and get a bottle of bubbles. Just get, get a bottle of bubbles, have it on your desk, have it in your, your bag, have it nearby um, and be able to breathe in what can let you, allows you to feel settled and blow out all that stuff that you no, no longer serves you and isn't even yours to carry, right? And then oftentimes it's a little difficult to not smile when you see bubbles or blow bubbles. Um, so it's one um, thing that I can offer. Does anyone else have, what are, what are your kind of things that you go to that you do for self-care for those of us um, that may be listening and like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I have these um, essential oils that I, I use. Um, and even when I am actually working, because, you know, the work that we do could be uh, pretty intense, I have it. And so there are times that I am just constantly with my hand to my face, inhaling that, that oil to remind me that I need to center on um, sides, walking or just taking a, a, a mental meditation for a second. Like I, I, I need to check in with me. How am I doing? Am I showing up right now in my greatness or, or am I showing up in trauma? And so I want to really, I check in with myself often. So do a a mental check-in. Um, I shouted Grow Track out in the beginning of, um, of this session of this um, program. Uh, Grow Track is um, the, net, the largest uh, Black women's health and women's organization in the United States, and they have gotten women to take daily walks. And I've been walking with Grow Track for so many years now that I've trained my body to get up and take a walk every morning before I start work. So it kind of just lets me know like I'm first and like everything else is back. Because I think so many, so many of us become, our identities become like shaped with our work. And I'm like, no, it's, it's still me. And then it's still the work, um, even though I'm passionate about the work. So I pour into me first before I pour into anybody else. Um, but I'm a big affirmation person. I think a lot of this is tricking your brain. So you can tell yourself over and over again, like, you know, I'm going to have a great day or, you know, I'm going to feel empowered or I'm going to be kind to myself. Um, so I like to speak a lot of like great words um, to myself and just extend a lot of gentleness to myself. Like this world's already hard. 
Um, it's a lot of things that are thrown at us. And so if I make a mistake or a hiccup along the way, I just make sure that I'm being very gentle um, with myself in those moments. Yeah, that's powerful. Did anyone have any other thoughts before we move on to the next part about how do you take care of yourself? I will say that it definitely took me a long time to learn to take time out. I was the worst at boundaries, the worst at, I worked all the time. It was always work, work, work. Um, it still kind of is because I, I feel like, you know, when I leave public defender life, I go into my circle facilitator world and but it's I it took having a child for me to finally realize like oh yes you need to rest because then it turned into work child work child work child and I was like who am I how did I end up here what am I doing I don't know um so sometimes self-care to me just is me literally staring at the wall or staring outside and just decompressing in that way I have incorporated meditation practice because that does because that does help um but it took a while and I would suggest to anybody there who <laughs> was similar to me of like, I just work and that's what I do. Um, to try some things, even if, if to me, everything sounded hokey, I was like, what? I'm not doing that, I don't have time. Um, but to try anything, even going back to what you did as a child for fun, like, did you run? Did you play sports? Even if you were not that great at it, did you swim? Did you like, what was joy like for you in the past and try to go back to that, but um, definitely, a work 24 seven in recovery from that. Yeah, and thanks for that transparency because it is it is hard. It's not it's not always this, you know, people think of this, you know, self-care is just natural thing to do. Um, and oftentimes we do show up and, and as activists and abolitionists and we have all of this work to do, we don't have time to rest or so we think, right? Um, this has been absolutely amazing. And I'm going to invite all that are still here with us. Please stay on to the end. We have a very big announcement that Jesse will be sharing. So hang in there for these last few minutes so that you don't miss it. Um, yeah, and kind of wrapping up with, with, with this idea of self-care, um, you know, some people in the chat are talking about, yeah, with the essential oils um, and, you know, the face mask with lavender and essential oils and, and having the scent on it. So that way, you know, with the, the um, face mask, when you put it on, there's this aroma that's there. Um, taking five deep breaths and long exhales and asking, what do I need in this moment? right? Massages. Yes, absolutely. With massages and play therapy and nurturing, all of those things are super, super important. Um, and as we wrap up, um, I, I'd like to share a few of my thoughts. First, thank you so much to the amazing panelists. Um, this, I think we could go on for another hour or two. Um, this has been absolutely amazing um, and would love to continue this conversation. Um, but for tonight, <laughs> we're going to have to bring it to a close. But like I said, hold on, because we have really big news that's coming. Um, so just reflecting back uh, to all the things that we talked about, um, and just bear with me, I've kind of made a few notes as we went through. Um, it was just so much, so much to hold all in, in, in one space. But, you know, really being able to look at how the legal system is linked with our mental hair, mental hair, I'm sorry, it's been a long night, our mental health care um, systems, how it's so intricately linked and how the way the systems are even constructed, we're actually inviting coercion, whether it's through some of the mandates, um, whether it's through some of our, um, the ethical codes, our agency rules, and all of these other things that in some ways, as we've talked about, we actually perpetuate harm, even if that's not what our intentions are. So kind of going back to what I talked about in the very beginning and opening this, we have to be very intentional um, and purposeful to align what is our intentions, but not just stop there. What is the actual impact? What is the impact of our, our um, the ways that we engage, the ways that we interact with people? Um, looking at training itself 
being problematic, the training, some of the, the, the tools that we actually use, how all of those things also do harm. Um, and looking at you know, how individual care is also very intricately woven into communal care, how we can do this together as a collective um, and recognizing and remembering that what you need is actually already inside of you. And we need practitioners, um, people with lived experience, family members, all of us, every single one of us to recognize that and really coming from that strength-based piece um, and recognizing that abolition does have a place in mental health. Once we become complicit, we then are actually saying that it's okay to do harm in our communities that we're saying that we're trying to serve. Um, and, and taking that risk of trying to push back against these systems is a difficult thing. And it's also a personal choice but we can do it together as a collective. And we have a responsibility to join together um, and to also as clinicians when we're in positions to be able to also invite students to come into practices, to be able, since we know that some of these harms are done within the education system, what is our responsibilities to also be able to give the correct information, that holistic information to those that are coming behind us? So with all of that, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jess for a big announcement. So everyone, please hang in there. Um, and this has really been an honor. Thank you so much, Jackie. And thank you to all of our incredible panelists. I have been sitting here incredibly inspired and as always, cannot wait to watch this um, recording back. I um, Really want to encourage those of you who are still with us to hang on for just one more second, because like Jackie mentioned, we have really exciting news to share and we're just going to take one second to throw up a slide. And so a link is going to drop in the chat, but I wanted to let everyone know that registration uh, has just opened for Ida's fall training series and we really look forward to continuing the conversation from this evening. Um, the series is called Crisis as Catalyst, Building Embodied Futures. And really briefly, what I wanna mention is that a incredibly committed and thoughtful group of IDA organizers and members have been spending the last couple months of the summer dreaming up this series for you all. And we were really, we were inspired by resisting this idea of return to normal that unfortunately so many people have sort of started to say as if a pandemic has ended, which it hasn't. And even if it had, normal is not something that we want to go back to. Where we were before was incredibly oppressive and harmful for so many of our communities. And so what we want to do in this uh, five part series that starts next month is dreaming and building a better future uh, that centers uh, ancestral healing, uh, rooted in restorative and transformative justice practices, that looks at art and creativity and healing um, and so much more. So I'll keep it brief because I don't want to keep people, but I really, really hope that you will join us to continue learning and growing together in the fall. And um, we can take down the slides. Oh, thank you, <laughs> right, I shouldn't skip this part. Uh, so as we've said before, you'll be receiving a follow-up email from us in the next couple of days. We will send the recording. We uh, provide that in both kind of the panel view as well as speaker view, uh, resources mentioned, an anonymized version of the chat. And these are all of the links where you can stay in touch with us on social media. Um, really, again, super grateful for everyone who joined us. And if that is the last slide, we can take it down. I encourage everyone to turn on their videos one more time, our panelists. And I just wanted to thank Jackie for moderating, all of our incredible panelists for sharing your wisdom with us. I want to shout out our ASL interpreters and our live captioner. Thank you for making this event accessible. And thank you all for um, you know taking the time and deciding to spend your evening with us. This has been truly phenomenal. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, you can reach out to Ida and we, we hope to see you all again soon.